discovered that neuroplasticity is actually a feature of the nervous system, the brain, throughout our entire lifespan. The rules change a little bit in terms of how you rewire your brain. But if the question is, can a person change? Can you learn new things? Can you unlearn certain patterns? Can you overcome traumas at any age? So for people that want to change their brain, the power of focus is really the entry point. And the ability to access a deep rest and sleep. Mm. The, the brain is basically designed to be customized in the early part of life, and then to implement those algorithms and that circuitry for the rest of, your, of its life. I think that, you know, in terms of value of understanding the nervous system and where it can be steered, it's absolutely clear that the nervous system can change in response to experience. So this thing we call neuroplasticity is really that. It's the brain's ability to modify itself in response to uh -huh. experience. And I think it's important to understand that from birth till about age 25, the brain is extremely malleable in a kind of almost passive way where kids are exposed to things and the brain is just wiring up. I mean, the brain is really designed to adjust itself uh, in order to be in concert with its surroundings and to optimize that just the, the way we described a minute like ago. Like the way that mm -hmm. a child can learn a language very quickly or, or three languages. play the guitar or something yeah, like that. Yeah, without an accent. You know, right. Three languages without an accent. It's remarkable. You try and do that after age 25, it's very challenging. And so the, the brain is basically designed to be customized in the early part of life and then to implement those algorithms and that circuitry for the rest of, your, of its life. And so the brain can change in adulthood and it can change provided that there's an emphasis on some perceptual event. So in other words, if you wanna change your brain as an adult, let's say you wanna be less anxious, you wanna learn a new language, you wanna be more functional in some way, presumably. The key thing is to bring focus to some particular perception of something that's happening during the learning process. And the reason for that is that there's a neurochemical system involving acetylcholine. And it comes from these two little nuclei down in the base of the brain called nucleus basalis. All day long, you're doing things in a reflexive way. But when you do something and you think about it very intensely, acetylcholine is released from basalis at the precise neurons that were involved in that behavior. And it marks those for change mm. during sleep or during deep rest later. So for people that wanna change their brain, the power of focus is really the entry point. And the ability to access deep rest and sleep. Mm. Because most people don't realize this, but neuroplasticity is triggered by intense focus, but neuroplasticity occurs during deep sleep and rest. And we can talk about how to optimize those different brain functions. One of the things that's really important also to think about how the brain works in terms of plasticity and all this stuff is what the brain really wants to do is also pass as much of what it does off to reflexive behavior as possible. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> yeah. so when we're talking about focus, I think it can get a little bit vague, but it might be useful to think about like what exactly is focus and what triggers plasticity. So the brain loves to be able to just do things, pick up coffee cups and drink and walk and talk and do things and not put much energy into it. When we decide to focus, what the brain really does is it switches on a set of circuits that involve the frontal cortex and nucleus basalis and some others. And it's trying to understand duration, how long something's gonna last, path, what's gonna happen, and outcome, what ultimately is gonna happen. So duration, path, and outcome. You know, the, the events of early 2020 are a good example of this. One of the reasons why it's so exhausting to be alive in 2020 is because we are now having to pay attention to duration, path, and outcome. How long is this thing gonna last? When are, you know, when are they gonna open up all businesses? Did I touch that door handle? Does it matter? You know, right. who are the experts? Are there any experts? You know, there are a lot of questions. Whereas normally we can just move through life without having to do all that analysis. Mm. So if it's a simple example, like trying to learn a new language or a new motor skill, or a new way of conceptualizing something. Maybe somebody's in a therapeutic process and they're trying to work through a trauma or something like that. Duration, path, and outcome is built into the networks of the brain. We can do that very easily, but it takes work. And it almost has a feeling of underlying agitation and frustration. And that's because the circuits that turn on before acetylcholine are of the stress system. So when you or I decide we're gonna learn something and really dig in, Norepinephrine, which is adrenaline, is secreted in the brainstem and in the body, and it brings about a state of alertness. Then our attention, which is mostly a diffuse light, is brought 
to a particular duration path and outcome analysis. This would be thinking about what somebody is saying. What are they really trying to say? A hard passage of reading, a hard you know, set of math problems, you know, a challenging physical workout. When you do that, these two systems have to work very hard and the adult brain doesn't really wanna change the algorithms it learned in childhood. But if you do those two things, you have alertness and focus, the acetylcholine and the norepinephrine converge to mark those synapses for change. Mm. And so, so the way to think about neuroplasticity if one wants to change their brain is bring about the most intense concentration you can to something and then later bring about the least amount of concentration to that thing. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but there were some studies that were done at Stanford by a guy named Eric Knudsen that showed that plasticity in the, in the adult brain, any age can be as robust as it is in childhood, as fast and as dramatic, wow. provided the focus is there and it's all contingent on this acetylcholine molecule coming from nucleus basalis. So you say, well, how do you do that? How do you, right, how yeah. do you get it, you know? <laughs> exactly. Well, I've got friends that chew Nicorette thinking that's gonna get them there because Nicorette is a nicotinic acetylcholine agonist, but that's gonna globally increase acetylcholine. So I always tell them that's not the right approach. The right approach is to bring as much focus to a behavior or to a thought or to an action pattern. And there has to be a sense of urgency. So what Newton lab showed and another lab at UCSF, Mike Merzenich's lab showed is that if there's a serious contingency, like in order to get your ration of food each day, you have to learn this thing. The degree of plasticity is remarkable. Right. But if there isn't an incentive, it just isn't gonna happen. So these circuits in the brain that mother nature set up are designed to be anchored to a real need. And people always say to me, well, should I do something out of love and a real desire to learn or should it be out of fear? But either one works. The sense of urgency is just acetylcholine. Mm -hmm. It's norepinephrine. That's all it is. It doesn't, the brain doesn't have a recognition of whether or not something is pleasurable or not until later. Once you start accomplishing your goal, the reward systems like dopamine start kicking in. But I think if people are interested in modifying their brain for the better, at least some you know, top contour understanding of how urgency and focus must converge for that to happen mm. can be useful because I think there's a lot of attention paid to whether or not something feels like flow or whether or not it's the, what I call highly desirable states right. or whether or not you can, you can eat a plant out of the ground that will magically put your brain into a state of plasticity. Right. And the answer is yes, <laughs> such plants exist, uh -huh. but what's missing is the focus component. If that work is not done with a particular end goal in mind, you'll get plasticity, but you'll get plasticity in a kind of across the board. It's like learning nine lang learning a little bit of nine languages all at once is not gonna make you speak coherently in any one of them. So focus is the key. Well, in my case, it took a, a fear circumstance, fear of becoming a permanent failure yeah. to motivate immense change. and. Um, uh, that was that circumstance. I, I do believe, however, that the best work, our most creative and best work comes from a, a love of craft. But sometimes in order to find what you truly love, you have to be scared into setting off on a path to find it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and, and, and that goes for relationships too. Sometimes to find the right relationship um, or relationships, it could be friendships, romantic relationships, et cetera one has to be like deathly afraid of having to remain in the, the relationship that you're in enough to leave. So neuroplasticity is absolutely real. Um, it actually worked out that my scientific great grandparents, two guys, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, won the Nobel Prize for, no, for neuroplasticity. Now they weren't the people who discovered it. It had actually been described for centuries. People understood that young kids can learn more easily than it, adults can. But David and Torsten won the Nobel Prize for essentially formalizing the, and discovering the principles of neuroplasticity, how it works. And then some years later, mainly one guy by the name of Mike Merzenich, but there were others that worked with him, discovered that neuroplasticity is actually a feature of the nervous system, the brain, throughout our entire lifespan. The rules change a little bit in terms of how you rewire your brain. But if the question is, can a person change? Can you learn new things? Can you unlearn certain patterns? Can you overcome traumas at any age? The answer is absolutely, categorically, yes. How? 
Well, it's very clear that as a child until about age 25, more or less, just passive experience will shape the brain for better or worse. After about age 25, and again, these are not strict cutoffs, we can change our brain, but what's required is a marked shift in the neurochemical environment under which something happens. So one of the reasons why any traumatic event will forever be remembered, although by the way, you can remove some of the emotional load of that, trauma does not have to be traumatic forever, is because when we see or experience something very intense of a fearful nature, there is the release of certain what we call neuromodulators, things like epinephrine, adrenaline, and other neuromodulators that cause a state shift in our body and brain. And the nervous system recognizes this as unusual. And as a consequence, in the subsequent days, there's reordering of the connections so that the brain can prepare for that event should it happen again. This is why we have what's called one trial learning. You go to a certain location, something terrible happens there. You will forever associate that location with something terrible. But there are tools, therapy and other tools, that can allow the emotional load to be removed from that so that you could go to that location and feel calm, no fear whatsoever. The good news is you can also learn anything you want to learn, provided there's a shift in this neurochemical environment. This is why when we are very interested and focused on something, two of the main requirements for neuroplasticity, we have to be alert and we have to be focused. We can't learn passively as adults. We can't just play um, you know, a, a lecture about AI and large language models or neuroscience in the room, and then it just, the knowledge doesn't just sink in by osmosis. But if we pay attention and we're alert when we pay attention, there's a shift in the neurochemicals associated with that attention, what we call the catecholamines. It's three molecules, dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine, all which cause an increase in alertness, all which cause an increase in focus, a tightening of our visual field and our auditory field. So like cones of attention is one way to think about it. And then it sets in motion a bunch of biological processes such that if we get adequate sleep that night, maybe the next night as well, there's reordering of neural connections so that that knowledge, that new experience is consolidated in your brain. You are forever changed as a consequence of that experience. So when we hear that the brain is constantly changing, everything that we encounter changes our brain, that's not true. Why would the brain change unless it needed to, right? As a child, the brain is basically a template for change. It's, it's trying to understand the environment and make predictions. And so that's true. Neuroplasticity is, is a cardinal feature of, of childhood and adolescence and the teen years. And just think about the music you listened to when you were a teen. No other music will ever have as much significance. And that's because as a teen, your body is flooded with hormones and neuromodulators. The, the amount of meaning that comes from now seemingly trivial events when you're a teenager or adolescent is immense. That song meant so much, and it's because of the neurochemical milieu it creates in you. But as an adult, it takes a stronger stimulus, as we say. And if you were to fall in love as an adult or see something, a, a painting that just strikes you as just so unbelievable, yes, then you are forever changed. But just going to see a bunch of paintings at the Met doesn't mean that every single one of those paintings is forever stamped into your brain. The, the nervous system is very um, efficient in that way. It doesn't change unless it has to. And it always changes if it needs to in order to keep you safe. This is why there's an asymmetric influence of fear as opposed to um, just interest in terms of what will shift our brain. But it's nice to know that love and excitement and appreciation are very strong stimuli for changing the brain. And, um, you know, I can kind of draw to mind conversations I've had with my good friend, Rick Rubin. I'll get accused of name dropping, but I'm very fortunate to be close friends with Rick. And Rick always talks about, you know, how when you just see and experience something and you just have this love for it, it changes the brain. He's not a neuroscientist, but in many ways he's a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. So in any case, you absolutely can change your brain, but you have to pay attention to the thing you want to incorporate into your brain. You have to be alert while you do that. And then you absolutely have to go get some rest because it's during sleep and during meditative states and during rest that the actual rewiring of the brain occurs.